Hi, welcome to 45th Street Baptist Church. My prayer is that this message you're about to hear will be a blessing for you. I want you to sit back and listen. Let God's word infuse you. Let it grow you spiritually. And my prayer is that there will be some practical application for you. If you ever have a chance, why don't you stop by our physical location at 7600 Division Avenue over in the East Lake community. We'd love to have you come in. We believe that one step in the door will remind you why we claim to be the friendliest church from the parking lot to the pulpit. Well, here it comes. God bless you. How many of you can be very honest right now? <clears throat> very honest and admit that you can't understand why God would save you. How many of you can admit that? Knowing you the way you do, <laughs> the way nobody else knows you, how many of you can say, why in the world would God save me? I, I, I often wonder, knowing Andre, knowing I'm not worthy of it. But in the next instant, I'm just crushed with gratefulness. And I say, thank you, Lord, that you would save me that you would even consider me. And that's why we say, what a mighty God. A mighty, mighty God we serve. He is awesome. I'm awful. But he is awesome. Yeah. Only an awesome God can turn an awful man into something that's worthwhile. Only. Yeah. All right. I let you into my into my spiritual closet for a moment. That's all right. We all got one. Every now and then you gotta go in there and clean out stuff. Get up out of here. You don't belong in here. We started a sermon series a few weeks ago on relationships. The name of it is, Can We Talk? Can We Talk? And Ridge always wants to sing the song. <laughs> I know, Ridge. The name of the sermon series is, Can We, Can we Talk? Ridge used to listen to Tevin Campbell growing up. Yeah. I love that song. I'll let you in on another one. When I hear that song now, wasn't always the case, I can tell you now. When I hear that song now, I expect to see Karen. I look forward, when I hear that, when I hear that song, I'm uh, you know, trying to get my, my words together. Yeah, trying, trying to get my talk together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> can we, can we, can we talk? Life would be so difficult without romance. It would, wouldn't it just be flavorless? Even just the hope of it. If you've had it and, and it's gone, you want it again. Don't ever give up on love. Don't ever, ever, ever give up on love. I, I know people who have been married and, and then they're divorced and still looking. Thank God for it because there is a soulmate 
there for you. And I believe that what God doesn't allow you to have in terms of longevity, he will give you in intensity. I believe that. I believe that. Yeah, you might not have 15 or 20 years together, but it'll be so good for that period of time that my Lord, it'll seem like 15 or 20, it'll be condensed. Yeah, and so don't ever, don't ever give up, give up on love. The first, the first message in this series, we, we talked about for this cause, and we went back and we talked about marriage and what it is and how God instituted marriage. And we're so grateful that we understand the biblical foundation for marriage and what it all is supposed to be. And then we, we got more into the heart of the me message and we talked about last time for, I mean, we talked about a soft answer, how you have to communicate effectively with one another because a lot of relationships do poorly because we don't know how to talk to each other. We don't know how to mess up and straighten it up. We, we don't know, and the reason we don't know how to mess up and straighten it up is because we don't know what one another's love language is. And each one of us has a love language. And when you can discover what your significant other's love language is, then you can talk to them in the language of the love that they have. But most of us, it's almost like being in love with somebody who speaks Russian and you keep trying to figure it out in French. You're never going to communicate effectively under those circumstances. But, but when you love somebody enough and you know their love language, and I'm just, I'm just, you know their love language is Russian, you'll do everything in your power to learn Russian just so you can effectively communicate with them. Karen and I have been having this as I've been going through it. I've been asking Karen, Karen if she knows what her love language is. What her love language is. I believe it's quality time. I believe that's most valuable to her. Just spending time with someone. And last week, if you didn't get it, we'll make sure you get one at some point. We passed out what the five love languages are. And some, some, everybody fits in there somewhere. Some people might be straddling the fence on some of them, but uh, everybody's got a love language. How do you say I'm sorry? A soft answer is how you say I'm sorry. Most of the time, we said last week, we say, we say the right things, we just say it the wrong way. Our heart is right. Our intention is good but our tone is terrible. And we end up having a deeper discussion about tone than the situation. And that becomes a problem. We have to learn this early on. So today, we're gonna flip that script and say, okay, now I've apologized. What's the next step? What's the next step? If I have effectively apologized if I have sincerely apologized, what is the next step? And so today, we want to talk about true forgiveness. True. True. Everybody say true. true. Forgiveness. True forgiveness. This is, this is probably going to defy some people's understanding of how you forgive. And I'm probably going to tear down some little isms that we have about forgiveness. I don't think I'm going to be long today, but there's a passage of scripture. What's the problem? Baptist preacher saying I ain't going to be long. That does it. <laughs> Psalms 103. It's my favorite passage of scripture. Psalms 103. I want to start at verse 8. I want to start at verse 8. This is, this, is, this is worth reading. Psalms 103. I'm, I'm, I don't usually wait, but I'm going to wait for you to get there today. Psalm 103, starting at verse 8. 
and it reads, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always, King James Version says, chide, but this version says, accuse. Nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Verse 12 says, this is our action verse. Verse 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. And I love verse 13 and 14. It's my personal favorite. It says, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. And then verse 14 says, for he knoweth our frame, and he remembers that we are but dust. For he knoweth our frame, and he remembers, we forget, we forget in all our glory, in all our arraignment, in all our success, K.O. said, we want to be successful, but we forget about being significant. I didn't say it, K.O. said that, but it's good. Yeah, all our children, we tell them, I want you to be successful when you grow up, and we forget to tell them to be significant. Yeah, success without significance is like wind. It's like the wind. Be significant. In fact, stop telling them to be successful and tell them to be somebody. Be somebody. And that encompasses all of that. All of that. He knoweth our frame. He remembers. God never forgets. No matter how high you go, no matter what house you sit in, God never forgets that at your essence, you are dust. President is dust. Four-star general is dust. Dude standing on the street right now down on Fourth Avenue is dust. Preacher standing in the pulpit at 45th Street is God knows that with dust. For as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. What does it mean to forgive somebody? Have you ever been hurt? And I'm not, I'm not in any way trying to minimize anyone's life experience. So don't take that from what I'm saying today. But I want to ask you this question, and then Tam's going to show you a video. But I want to know if you've ever truly been hurt by someone and they came back and honored you with an apology and you forgave them. You forgave them. You earnestly, truthfully said, I, I forgive you. But then you found it was difficult for you to forget about it. You keep thinking about it. How do you deal with that? That's what we're going to talk about today. Does that mean you didn't forgive them? Because you keep thinking about it? Let's see. What are you not telling me? What are you accusing me of? How do you feel about Suwani? Never mind, I don't care for him. I feel disappointment. That's a lover's word. 
What about rage? Of all the people that I've looked into since this thing started, the one with the darkest Zuwani history is you. It was his landmines that killed you. Shh. We don't name the dead. Everyone who loses somebody wants revenge on someone on God if they can't find anyone else. <coughs> but in Africa, in Matopo, the coup believe that the only way to end grief is to save a life. If someone is murdered, a year of mourning ends with a ritual that we call the drowning mantra. There's an all-night party beside a river. At dawn, the killer is put in a boat, he's taken out on the water, and he's dropped, he's bound so that he can't swim. The family of the dead then has to make a choice. They can let him drown, or they can swim out and save him. The coup believe that if the family lets the killer drown, they'll have justice but spend the rest of their lives in mourning. But if they save him, if they admit that life isn't always just, that very act can take away their sorrow. Vengeance is a lazy form of grief. Wow. Vengeance is a lazy form of grief. The drowning man ritual. Some man has harmed a family member. If you didn't understand what she said. Harmed a family member in this African tribe's practice. A year later, not harmed, killed. Killed, let's be straight up kill the family member. They go through a year of mourning. A year later, they have an all-night party on the riverbank. At the end of the party, daybreak, they take the killer, bound his hands, put him on a boat, take him to the middle of the river, and drop him out. The family of the person who was killed then has to make a choice. Do I let him drown or do I save him? They believe that if you let him drown, then you have justice, but you will spend the rest of your life unhappy because you allowed the man to drown. But if you save him, they believe that you will be blessed because you in fact did save someone and you chose to give someone who wronged you, hear me now, you chose to give someone who wronged you forgiveness by giving them life. Forgiveness presupposes that a wrong has been committed. A wrong has been committed, not an irritation not an irritation. Today, we have minimized what a wrong is. What a wrong is. I'm not talking about somebody calling you a name. That's not, that's irritating. Might be true, but that, that, that is not. But it is not a wrong, all right? Writing something on your Facebook page is irritating, but that ain't no wrong. There's a quick remedy for that. It's called deactivate your Facebook page. And that goes for any other social, social media. Yeah, unliking a friend is not a wrong, it's a choice, it's a choice. Blocking somebody on any, in any medium is also not a wrong, but a choice. 
You don't have to be with people. That's a choice. If you speak or behave unkindly to someone and you bring harm to them, now their reputation, that's a different thing. You bring harm to them or their reputation by your actions or your words, that wrong demands an apology. You gotta apologize under those circumstances. To, if you are concerned about restoring the relationship, you have to apologize. See, when you wrong somebody under any circumstances, there is a barrier put in place between you and them. And until you can come and properly apologize and be received, that barrier will remain in place. So, time won't remove the barrier. It won't. Only a sincere apology and genuine forgiveness will remove, it takes both of them. You have to have a sincere apology and you have to have genuine forgiveness to remove the barrier. Follow me now. There are three Hebrew words and four Greek words in Christian scripture, in our Christian history that we have to be aware of. I'm not gonna give them to you today. I'm just gonna summarize them. They mean collectively to forgive, all right? To forgive or to pardon, and I like this one, to take away. That's what the words mean. To, to, to pardon, pardon, or to take away. When God forgives, he takes away what we have done. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from us. I got a better one for you. It's another one of my favorite scriptures. It's Isaiah, if you've been in Bible study with me, Isaiah 43 and 25. 43 and 25. I love this scripture. It gave me, when I first found out about the scripture, it gave me a depth of understanding about how God forgives us. All right? Isaiah 43 and 25. I know Tam is pulling it up. But it, it simply reads. Oh, she did. She's, go ahead, Tam. Give it up for Tam. Yeah. Isaiah 43 and 25. Isaiah, call, I mean, the Lord caused Isaiah to write this. The Lord said, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. Oh, my Lord. When I read this, see, see the problem you and I have is not the forgiving, it's the remembering. Don't folks say that all the time. I forgive you, but I ain't going to forget it. But God in his holiness doesn't treat our sins that way. Because he's holy, God can't even remember sin. If he remembers our sin, he's got to punish us. He must punish us. And yet, We'll put a rope around some wrong somebody did to us and hold on to it. It's almost like ammunition. Yeah, and we'll bring it up at certain times. Sometimes for them, sometimes just to re-victimize ourselves, to validate ourselves. You know, folk always mistreat me, remember? <laughs> Been 30 years ago. So, first thing you need to write down about forgiveness today, and this is core principle. Forgiveness is not a feeling. 
but is a decision. Forgiveness is not a feeling, but it's a decision. The decision is to extend grace instead of demanding justice. That's a big one. Now, remember what I said, we wouldn't even be in this situation if you weren't wronged. There would be no need for a, an apology and for you to forgive if you weren't actually wrong. So we can go ahead right now and you can say, I was wrong. The question is, what do I now do with this situation? And I believe this, every day you hold the hurt, it harms you. Every day you hold the hurt, the one who is harmed is you. And so you got to decide at what point is enough hurt enough? And do I move on with this situation? Point one, forgiveness does not destroy our memory. Forgiveness does not destroy our memory. I've forgiven them, but I can't forget. That's normal. Okay? That's normal. You have a conscious memory. That's what's going on right now. Everyone is consciously aware that I'm standing up here talking right now. Every person in here is consciously aware of it. But as I'm standing up here talking, each one of you also has a subconscious memory that's working. And even though nobody in here can see it, while I'm talking to you about somebody hurting you in this active sense, your subconscious brain is reminding you of the last person who did something wrong to you. Your subconscious memory is at work right now. And you're asking yourself, have I really forgiven that person? This is what's going on in every brain in here right now. Nobody else knows. It'd be interesting if we could have a digital readout of everybody's. I mean, I've been seeing your eyes roll back. Yeah, some of y'all don't whisper the name. Because <laughs> we've all had something. Nobody in here is immune from it. It doesn't matter your circumstance or your situation. Everybody's been harmed. Some of us is our spouse. Some of us is our sibling. Some of us is our parent, co-worker, neighbor. Some of us have done more harm to ourselves than anybody could ever do. And you've never forgiven yourself. We could have a hallelujah good time today if you would just forgive you. Just you. Just pull out your compact mirror and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm cute too, but I'm sorry. God is not mad at you. He's not. He's forgiven you. And forgiveness, true forgiveness, means something mean something to God. Yeah, if you are struggling with forgiving someone because you cannot stop remembering what they've done, then you and the Lord need to spend more time together and you need to turn it over to the Lord. Because uh, we sing that song all the time. I feel better, so much better. Since I laid my, and see some of y'all been carrying the burden around like a backpack. Get up in the morning, everything going all right, but you got before you go out the door, you got to pick me get this burden. Take my burden around with me, let everybody know. People who know me know it's gonna come up in my conversation before long. People can see it all over my countenance. Everything is going well in my life, and yet I got a burden on me. It's because you won't forgive. Forgive somebody. The situation is not going to change. The wrong that they've done to you will still be a wrong tomorrow. 
The question is, how will you deal with it today? Today, are you gonna keep on letting the wrong that somebody did yesterday mess up all your tomorrows? True forgiveness. Forgiveness does not destroy our memory too. Forgiveness does not remove the consequences of the wrongdoing. All right? Some of you are mad at him because he promised to always love you, and he didn't. He didn't love you when he said it. Let's be honest. He didn't. And you still mad at him? And every time you see Junior, it reminds you of him? And so you're mad all over again? That's not always with a man, this is a woman too. She said she was gonna be yours. And every time you show up at wherever, she with him, and he was your friend, and you mad? Oh, come on, don't act like that. Tyler Perry ain't the first one to come up with that. This happens life, this is life. This is people. So forgiveness does not remove the consequence of sin. Mama saved up all her money, been working two jobs. She's gonna get her a new house, working hard. Got her money, got it stashed away. For some reason, she won't put it all in the bank. She got some of it in the room. Junior got a drug problem. <laughs> Junior get, in up in, get up in the house, looking around, he find mama money. He go spend mama money. Blow it, of course he's gonna blow it. Mama finds out, mama is crushed. Why would Junior do this to me? Junior is crushed because he is finally hit rock bottom, so he sincerely goes to treatment, gets help. <clears throat> is in recovery, is living a productive life, goes back to mama, mama, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I know I messed up. Please forgive me, mama says, baby, I forgive you, and means it. There has been an apology that was sincere, there has been forgiveness that was sincere, but guess what? Mama money still gone. Mama's money is still gone. Forgiveness does not remove the consequences of wrongdoing. And yet, we are still admonished to forgive. If all you're concerned about is the money, you're going to have trouble forgiving. But if your concern is for Junior to get better, then you don't have any problem. And if you believe, hear me, let's go to another level. If you believe that the same God who allowed you to get that money the first time under the right circumstances can bless you to get it again, then you don't have any problem turning that whole situation over to the Lord and saying, fix it, Lord. And I tell you what, if it was $10,000 that, uh, that Junior stole, then that's a small price to pay for him to hit rock bottom and get back to a right way of thinking, you bought his shame. And his shame is what took him to treatment, and that's why he's living better. There's a whole lot of ways you can look at why you ought to forgive somebody. But it doesn't remove, doesn't remove the consequences of wrongdoing. Three, forgiveness does not rebuild trust. Forgiveness does not rebuild trust. She was unfaithful to me, but she ended that affair, and I've forgiven her, but I don't trust her. Where you going? Who you going with? Is that unusual? Does that mean I haven't forgiven you? No, it simply means that I must rebuild my trust in you. I love you, but you got to prove that you're not going to continue to step on my heart. Oh, it's the same way with everybody now. Nobody goes through this without expecting some increased consequences. So. I forgave you, but trust has to be built. Two things that require to rebuild trust. The first is changing behavior. Changing behavior. 
If you are sincere and that you've apologized, then I ought to see a change in your behavior. And the second thing is being transparent. The person who did the wrong, who wants to stay on the side of forgiveness, who wants to not bring that back up, ought to live life as an open book. No questions asked. No calls for any concern over what I'm doing. Being transparent for the injured person is essential to rebuilding trust. Got to be transparent. And then the last thing, and I'm out of here, is this is the hard one. Forgiveness doesn't always result in reconciliation. Does not always result in reconciliation. Reconciliation means to bring back to harmony. To bring back to harmony. And so the question is, how long does it take to bring back to harmony in any given situation? Well, it depends. Some people forgive quickly. Other people, it's a work that takes some time. Sometimes you have to go to professional counseling. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't let that be a barrier to getting better. If you need to go see somebody to talk about what's going on, then go see them. There's no shame to the approach of going to talk to somebody. I'll quickly tell folk what I'm not qualified to counsel them on. Quickly. So don't just talk to anybody about it now. Because everybody can't help you. Everybody that say they can help you can't help you. All right, that's, that's very, very important. What if somebody has harmed me, Reverend Sparks, and they won't apologize? What would happen? What do I do? Sometimes, sometimes a situation calls for a loving confrontation with somebody. You need to say, you know, you did ABC to me, and I didn't like that. Before you will continue to allow that barrier to exist between you and that person, you need to let them know because they may not be aware that their actions caused this damage to you. You need to lovingly confront them and let them know. And that's not limited to one, one time, all right? An apology says, I value our relationship. And because I value our relationship, I'm willing to come to you and remove any barrier that might exist between us. So not apologizing means, by definition, either I don't know or I don't care. It was one of the two. And if I don't know, then lovingly confronting them will bring them to awareness that this is going on. But in the end, in the end, forgiveness doesn't always result in reconciliation. It doesn't. I forgive you, but we can't be married no more. That is a possibility. Yeah, I'm saying that. Yeah, I forgive you. You, you didn't treat me right. You put your hands on me. No, we can't be married no more. We might, we can be cordial. And look, I've forgiven you, but we can't hang out no more. I I've forgiven you, but we're not going to be, you know, in one another's regular circle anymore. See, see, hear me now. I've forgiven you. See, some people take forgiveness to mean everything's all right. And what I've just spent this time telling you is even though I've forgiven you, that doesn't mean everything else is going to go back to all right. It simply means I remove the barrier that exists between the two of us. 
I no longer harbor this hurt or harm or, or ill feeling towards you. I've forgiven you. But now we can't go to the movies. Don't expect such from me. But I forgive you. And I wish nothing. I pray for you. And therein lies, if you've forgiven someone sincerely, you won't have trouble praying for them. You won't have trouble asking the Lord to bless them and, and, and to keep them. If you've forgiven somebody truthfully, then you'll ask the Lord to intervene in their lives. Look, 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 look. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I always like to say this. It's almost impossible for you to continually, every day, ask the Lord to give to you what you deny somebody else. You ask the Lord to bless you and forgive you every day for your sins and yet you deny somebody else the same thing and so that begs the question today have you attempted to remove the barrier that exists between you and the Lord do you know that there is a barrier between you and the Lord from the day you were born there was a barrier between you and, and the Lord. Adam and Eve put a barrier between you and the Lord. There is one who came to break down that barrier for us. His name is Jesus. And we believe that Jesus' sole mission on earth was to come and remove the barrier of sin between us and the Lord. The Lord wants us to be in harmony with him. He desires that from us. He wants to be at peace with us. And he's given us a way to do it. All he said is, he is my only begotten son. I'm going to give him to you. All I ask is that you believe on his work. Now Jesus had to come. Jesus had to live. Jesus had to die, but Jesus was resurrected. The Bible says clearly, whosoever believes in him shall have everlasting life. Believing on that restores harmony between you and the Lord. So nobody knows this question, the answer to this question but you. Have you apologized to the Lord? Have you asked the Lord to forgive you? Because I can tell you this, if you have sincerely, earnestly, truthfully asked the Lord to forgive you, he has. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression, our sin, our wrong from us and so today is the day you've just realized I need to be at peace with the Lord I extend to you the invitation to make that public declaration that's all it is because it starts right there where you are right now make that public de declaration today true forgiveness starts in your heart while the choir stands to sing the song right now the doors of the church are open for those who all want to be candidates for baptism for those who want to reconnect with the church if they've been a part of it. For those who want to join our fellowship under Christian experience. The doors are open for each one of those situations. Whosoever will, let them come right now. Well, there it is. I hope you were blessed by the God's word. It's my prayer that you will grow from this message. But in case you need a refresher, you can always stop by our physical location and worship with us at 7600 Division Avenue over in the East Lake community. I believe one visit and you'll find out that we truly are the friendliest church from the parking lot to the pulpit. Looking forward to meeting you. God bless you. Take care.